All right, um, so we're working our way through this morning. Uh, we're getting to the last line in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we've been going through this for a number of Sundays, looking at the Lord's Prayer as a, oh, I gotta turn this on, as a model for discipleship, that pretty much everything you need to, to know to start following Jesus, you find in this, in this prayer, in the Lord's Prayer. And so last Sunday, we talked about what it means for us to be forgiven and what it means for us to offer uh, forgiveness to others. And this is every day, ordinary stuff. Jesus expects every day you're going to have to go to him and ask for food, so give us today our daily bread. Every day you're going to need forgiveness, so we go to the Father for forgiveness. Every day you're going to have somebody else to forgive, so we forgive them. And now we come to this last line, uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And Jesus expects this is going to be part of your everyday life. If you're going to be one of my followers, every day you're going to deal with temptation. You're going to deal with an enemy who's trying to get you off track. And so this is where uh, the prayer ends. Um, And just want to say a quick note. The way that we've learned this prayer, there's an ending on it, right? For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And if you look in your Bibles, that ending is is not in your Bible unless you have a a King James Bible. And I just want to briefly tell you the story. Um, This is how Matthew originally recorded Jesus giving us the Lord's Prayer. The early church in the first couple hundred years, when they started praying this prayer, um, they added on, for yours is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever. Power and the glory, I wrote those wrong. Forever and ever, amen. Um, And it's interesting, Andy, that you read from 1 Chronicles 29, 13, because our ending comes out of 1 Chronicles 29, 11. Two verses before what Andy just read. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. And so what early Christians started doing is they took this from 1 Chronicles 29, they added it on to the end of the Lord's Prayer, and that's what they prayed in church. And later on, as people copied the book of Matthew, that longer version got copied into the book of Matthew. And so now, even though that ending is not probably the original of what Jesus taught, we pray it anyways because it feels incomplete if we just end it where that is. So we add this on when we pray. If you have more questions... Um, check out the adult Sunday school videos online or come and talk to me and say, what do you mean, what's going on here? And I'll gladly walk through that with you. Um, But let's move on to this line, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I just want to make a few observations at the start. I want to talk about a couple words. This word temptation um, can also be the word testing. So we could have translated this into English as lead us not into testing. Uh, It's the same word in Greek. Sometimes it gets translated as temptation, sometimes as testing. And in English, there's a difference, right, between a test and a temptation, right? Some things can be a test but not a temptation. So say you're doing uh, the 30-hour... You guys still... You don't still do the 30-hour famine, do you? Anybody remember doing the 30-hour famine? Okay. You would go without food for 30 hours to raise money for World Vision. Um, So say you're doing that and you're into hour 27... And if I was doing that and someone put a piece of cheesecake in front of me, that would be a test. Not really a temptation, because I don't really care about cheesecake. It's too rich, it's too sweet, eh, whatever. Now, if someone put like a fresh Delicio pizza, I like frozen pizza for some reason, those are my favorite, put that in front of me, that would be a temptation, right? My mouth would start watering, it'd be like, I want this, okay? So that's a difference between a test and a temptation. And we can look at this both ways. Um, And it's going to get important when we talk about Jesus. Was Jesus tested or was Jesus actually tempted? Um, So that word can go both ways. And then um, deliver us from the evil one. So that in Greek can be translated as the the evil one or it can be translated as evil. Just deliver us from evil. And either translation is perfectly acceptable. And I really don't think there's much difference if God delivers us from evil or from the evil one, they are, they are one and the same. Your Bible might have a, a footnote on one of those uh, words. So as we look at this line, and we're in Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, um, we have to remember that if you're reading through the book of Matthew, you read Matthew chapter 4 like three minutes ago. Okay, It's not long before Matthew chapter 4. And in Matthew chapter 4, we read that Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So, Jesus goes, and we're not going to go through this whole story this morning, but he's in the wilderness for 40 days without food. I don't know how long any of you have ever gone without food. Um, 
40 days is a really long time. Uh, and Matthew says he was hungry. Well, yeah, uh, that's an understatement. Jesus was famished. He was, I don't know what to describe, extremely hungry. Um, and the devil shows up to tempt him, right? And the first temptation is make some bread out of these stones. And so Jesus goes through this temptation. There's three temptations that the devil gives him, and Jesus uh, resists each one. And that was hard. That was beyond hard for Jesus. Up to his point in life, up to his 30 years, Jesus had never done anything harder than those 40 days and those temptations by the devil. And I would say he didn't do anything harder until the cross. I can't imagine going 40 days without food and then having to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil. That's a hard thing to do. And Jesus just went through that. So when Jesus says, lead us not into temptation, I think what Jesus is saying is, pray that what happened to me never happens to you. Pray that what happened to me never happens to you. Jesus has been there. He's been through that temptation. And he says, you guys should pray that God keeps you away from that. So when we talk about this verse, don't, don't uh, miss Matthew chapter 4, which is just a couple chapters before. Um, three observations about this verse, and then we're going to go into some other scripture as well. Number one, Jesus does not say, lead us not into sin. Did you notice that? He doesn't say, lead us not into sin. Um, it's not about not sinning. It's about not being tempted. See, and obviously temptation leads to sin. Um, but once we're tempted, we're usually done for. We're really weak creatures. Sometimes we can face temptation and we can overcome it. But for the most part, we do not do well with temptation. So Jesus doesn't say, lead us not into sin. It's actually, lead us not into temptation, because that temptation is going to lead us into sin. So Jesus wants to keep us away from the temptation altogether, not just from sin, but from the temptation. So that's the first observation. The second one is that this request uh, rules out deliberately entering into a situation of tempting. We cannot pray, God, deliver me from temptation, and then walk into a situation that's tempting. If, say, your temptation is um, drinking, say you've had a problem in your life with drinking and it's really hard, you can't say, God, deliver me from temptation as I walk into this bar. Okay? This request assumes that we are working with God. We are doing all we can to avoid temptation, and we're asking our Father, would you help us? Help, help us in this cause to avoid temptation. So this assumes that we are working with God, not against God. And three, God is interested in helping us avoid temptation. Um, he's interested in helping us get around the schemes of the devil. Sometimes we have a false view of God. The idea that somehow God is up in heaven and he's looking down and watching us dealing with temptation and wondering how we're going to do, hoping we're going to do well. Um, if, if I go to a hockey game, um, I don't want to sit behind the glass. Some people think those are the best seats. Those are the most expensive seats. I actually like sitting way up high. Because when you sit up high, you can see the whole play develop, right? You can see, okay, here comes this guy with this puck, and oh no, he doesn't see this guy. Here he comes, and he hits him, and whatever, right? I like being able to see the play develop. Sometimes I think we think of God like that. He's up there looking down. Oh, there's Jeff going about his day. Oh, I see temptation coming his way. Man, and maybe, you know, he's wondering, I hope, I wonder how Jeff's going to do. Is he going to say no to this temptation or not? And maybe he's even cheering for us. Come on, Jeff, you can do it. That's a false view of God. He is not up in the heaven, down, looking down, watching us with temptation. He's interested in helping us. He's there on the ice with us, saying, look out for this. Let me lead you over here. This is going to be a better path. He's actually in the game with us. He's not down just watching us, saying, I wonder how they're going to do. God's actually interested in helping us with temptation. We think, well, you know, that's not a fair fight if we have God on our side. No, it's not. God's okay with that. And I'm glad for that too, that God actually wants to help us. Nothing in the Lord's Prayer is the Father reluctant to give. When we ask for our daily bread, it's not that God says, oh, I don't really want to give you your daily bread, but okay, here. No, he's eager to give. When we ask for forgiveness of our sins, it's not that God is like, well, I don't know if I forgave you yesterday. I don't know if I, uh. That's not how God is. He's eager to forgive. 
He's eager to lead us not into temptation. He's eager to help us away from the evil one. So, we start there. Um, it's not about not sinning. It is. But it's about not being tempted in the first place. We can't enter into uh, temptation when we pray this. And we have to understand that God is for us. And so I want to look at some more scripture. I want to do a little bit of a survey through the New Testament, uh, five or six different passages that talk about temptation so that we can get a bigger picture of this. So I'll have the scriptures up, but if you want to open your Bible, you can, you can flip through these as well. Um, so the first one is one more that Jesus says from the Gospel of Matthew. And this is the situation. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane just before he goes to the cross. And he's taken Peter, James, and John along with him because Jesus wants to pray. He's going to ask his father to get out of this. Jesus says, I don't want to go to the cross, but I'll submit my will to yours. And this is what Jesus says to his disciples. He says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And for these disciples, the temptation is going to be coming in the next few hours when things go bad for Jesus, their temptation is going to be to turn their back on Jesus and save their own skin and run away. And every one of them falls into that temptation, especially Peter. And so Jesus says, be careful, this temptation is coming. Um, and this has become a familiar saying for us, right? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is my motto for Monday night hockey. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And we say this all the different times in different ways. Um, but when we look at our own lives, we, um, we, don't, we say a hearty amen to, yeah, the flesh is weak. I, don't, I probably don't have to convince any one of you when we're talking about temptation that your flesh is weak. You all know your flesh is weak. I know my flesh is weak. We've all been through this a million times before. We know that our flesh is weak. I would encourage you to not miss the spirit is willing part. Yes, we have weak flesh, but we have willing spirits. There is actually a spirit inside of you. When you come to Christ and the spirit fills you, your spirit actually doesn't want to sin. Your spirit actually only wants to obey God, only wants to seek his face 100% all the time. We're, we're good on knowing how much our flesh is weak. Don't forget your spirit is very willing. There is something inside of you that does not want to sin, that wants to say no to temptation every time. And be thankful for that. Some people don't have that. Some people don't have a willing spirit. Their spirit is completely degenerate and they only want to do whatever they want to please their flesh. But not you. You actually have a spirit in you that's at war with your flesh. And Paul talks about this in Galatians chapter 5. And he talks about, uh, he echoes Jesus here about the spirit and the flesh being against each other. And this is uh, Paul's strategy for dealing with temptation, dealing with sin in Galatians. He says this, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. It's the same way of saying the Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So the solution here for avoiding sin is to walk by the Spirit. Paul says, if you walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. There is a Holy Spirit. There is a God who is at work by His Spirit in our world, in our lives. And the Spirit wants to speak to us, wants to lead us, wants to teach us how to walk in step with Him. So walking by the Spirit means, first of all, being aware that there is a Spirit, God's Spirit is at work, and I want to listen. Okay, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? How do I understand you? How do I obey you? How do I walk in step with you? And when we do that, when we're preoccupied with that, when all my mind is thinking about is, okay, Spirit, well, how are you at work? How do I hear you? How do I walk with you? I'm not going to be gratifying the desires of the flesh. I'm going to be too busy with the things of the Spirit. And probably many of us have seen this at different times in our life. Maybe you go on a mission trip or something and it's just, you know, God's spirit is at work and people are coming to the Lord and you're busy working and helping and do all these things. There's very little time to gratify the desires of the flesh because you're so busy with the things of the spirit. Um, it's not a silver bullet. 
It's not saying, boy, if you just focus on the Spirit, you'll never have temptation. Not at all. When Jesus got the Spirit, right, he got baptized. When Jesus came out of the water, the Holy Spirit came down onto Jesus. What's the next thing that happened to Jesus? 40 days of temptation. It's not saying that if we pursue the Spirit, you're never going to be tempted again. Or if you've got temptation in your life, you must not be pursuing the Spirit. That's not it at all. But the more we focus on the Spirit, the less we have energy for things of the flesh. Sometimes we focus, you know, if you're dealing with temptation, say you've got something that just keeps coming and it's this temptation that you just can't get rid of. You can focus all your energy on that temptation and try so hard not to do it. You'll probably fail. But if you focus all your energy on walking by the Spirit, you'll just all of a sudden find, boy, I'm actually not so tempted to do that anymore. So this is Paul's strategy, uh, and I think it's a good strategy. I've seen this in my life. When I focus on trying not to gratify the desires of the flesh, I don't do very well. But when I focus on trying to walk by the Spirit, I find that some of those other things fall away quite naturally. Paul also says in 1 Corinthians 10, one of the maybe most well-known verses on temptation. He says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. 1 Corinthians 10.13 And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can endure it. So I want to just look at these three sentences in this one little verse. This this verse has probably helped me uh, deal with temptation more than anything else in Scripture. Number one, all temptation is normal. Whatever you're tempted with, it's normal. It's common to mankind. This is normal, everyday stuff. Please do not be shocked or embarrassed by what you are tempted to do. It's normal. It's common. The things that you're tempted with are the same things I'm tempted with, same things other people are tempted with. It's pretty common. Don't look at yourself and say, what's wrong with me to have this kind of temptation? Or what's wrong with that person? Why could they be tempted to do that? Don't go there. Please don't beat yourself up over what you're tempted to do. And please, please don't beat other people up over what they're tempted to do. Temptation is not sin. Sometimes we blur the line between these two. Temptation is normal. It's a regular part of life. You'll be tempted to do stuff until you die. Temptation is not sin. We never have to go to God and say, God, please forgive me for being tempted to do this. Never. Temptation is not sin. When we act on that temptation, it becomes sin. And then it's a problem. But it's not a problem before that. It's it's a regular part of life. Jesus tells us to pray every day. Lead us not into temptation. He expects we're going to be tempted. I'm going to be tempted. You're going to be tempted. Get used to it. It's normal. Number two, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. God is for you. He's actually on your side when it comes to temptation. He limits it. It's almost the idea that you're here and God's got you in this fence with a gate. And he only lets certain things through that gate. You can imagine the worst temptation you'll ever face in your life, something that would just be insurmountable. God's never going to let that through the gate. He's never going to let you face that. Now, you can walk out of that gate. You can head out of that gate and head into that world of temptation where it's so strong that you can't say no. That's your, your freedom. You're free to do that. But if you choose to stay in God's care, he's going to limit the temptation that comes your way. He won't let you have any temptation that's unbearable. You're never to to a point where you can say, there's no way I can say no to this temptation. God's never going to let that happen. And thirdly, when you are tempted, he'll provide a way out so you can stand up under it. It's always there. This is a guaranteed prayer. If you want a prayer that God answers 100% of the time, I'll give you one. Next time you're tempted, say, God, I'm tempted to do this. What's the way out? And God will answer you in that moment right there what the way out is. Every time. I've never in my life prayed that prayer and had silence from God. Every time you ask, God, what's the way out? He'll show you. Here's the way out. Now, it's up to me whether I want to take that way out or not. Sometimes the way out comes with a cost. Sometimes God says, here's the way out, Jeff. You need to call this person and tell them you're tempted with this right now and ask if they'll pray for you. That's your way out. And I might say, 
oh, that's a high price to pray. I don't know if I want to take that way out. And then it's up to me. And maybe I say, and sometimes I say yes, and sometimes I've said no. And if I say no, God, I'm not taking your way out, then that temptation turns into sin. But God always gives us a way out. Wherever you are, ask him in that moment. He'll show you a way out. God is faithful. Usually the way out is to flee. It's to run away from it. This, we see this first in Joseph, who's in Potiphar's household, right? And Potiphar's wife comes to Joseph, and they're alone together. And she says, come, come to bed with me. Come sleep with me. And Joseph's reaction is, he doesn't pray. He doesn't preach. He doesn't go to the Bible. He runs away. There's temptation. He just runs away from it. And in the New Testament, that's usually the, the practice for what we do with temptation. We just get away from it. We just run away from it. We think of a, a mature Christian is the one who's able to face temptation. And, you know, they're there right in the face of temptation. But they're a strong Christian and they can handle it. That's not a mature Christian in the New Testament. Mature Christians run away. They just run away from it. The temptation's always going to be there. They get away as fast as they can. That's our prayer in the Lord's Prayer. Lord, lead me not into temptation. It's not help me beat temptation. It's I want to get away from this entirely. I don't do well with temptation. Keep me away from it. We might say, well, come on. Don't we have God on our side? Don't we have the Holy Spirit in us? We can stand up to temptation. It sounds good. It sounds right. Um, but it's not Jesus' strategy. And it's not Paul's strategy either for you to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil in temptation. Um, their strategy is to avoid temptation as much as possible. Paul, when he writes in the same letter to the Corinthians, he talks about idolatry, which is a real temptation for the people in their church. They came from a background where they all worshipped idols, and many of them are still tempted to go back with that. And what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 10, 14? Flee from idolatry. Run away from it. These same Christians had lots of sexual sin in their life that they came out of, and coming to Jesus meant leaving behind all of that stuff. And it was a real temptation for these Corinthians to go back to that sort of lifestyle. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 6, 18? Flee from sexual immorality. Run away from it. He doesn't say try to beat it, try to conquer it, try to whatever. Just run away from it. Get away as far as you can, because your flesh is weak. Yeah, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak, so get away from it. There's not a lot that I remember from my youth about what my pastor ever said, but I remember one story. My pastor told a story of how when he was a young man in his early 20s, he was in Amsterdam and walking through the red light district of Amsterdam. And if you know anything about that, that's a part of Amsterdam uh, where prostitution is legal and it's a certain area of, of uh, Amsterdam where every sort of sexual sin that you can imagine is there in glaring lights and in the windows, it's all around you. And he's walking through this area. And a woman comes out of one of the buildings and makes an offer to him to come inside. And you're going to see and experience all the things that you've ever wanted to do. And he looked at her and he said nothing. And he turned and he ran down the street as fast as he could. And she called out after him and she mocked him and, and made fun of him. That was the most mature thing that he could have done in that moment. He, his flesh was not strong enough to say no to that temptation. And so God gave him a way out, which was run. And he ran away. I taught that to my students. And one day I'm sitting in my office and there's a knock on my door and the student comes in and he is out of breath. He can't even talk. It took him about 30 seconds till he could get a few words out because he was just dying. I ran, he says. I ran. And as he got his breath back, he started to tell me what he ran from. And he was off in the woods with a girl. And she had plans for what they were going to do in the woods. And it was a temptation that he was not strong enough to overcome. And he looked at her, and he turned, and he ran. And he did not stop running until he got to my office. And he left that girl all alone in the woods. <laughs> and I said, I am so proud of you. That is the most mature thing you could have done. He could have stayed there. He could have prayed, you know, God, give me strength. He could have tried to think of some scripture. None of that would have done it. Run away. That's the, that's the typical biblical pattern for temptation. Run away. 
So sometimes we can physically run away, right? Sometimes there's a situation where we're tempted. We just need to get out of there. We just need to go somewhere else. Sometimes it's not so easy to physically run away. Maybe it's a thought that's in your head of temptation. How do you run away from a thought? This is the part where you ask God, okay, God, I'm tempted here. What's my way out of this? God will show you a way out. If he doesn't, I'll buy you dinner or whatever you want. God always answers that prayer. So temptation is normal. Whatever you're facing is normal. Um, God's faithful. He limits it. And he'll always give you a way out of temptation. Now we move to James. James 1, verses 12 to 15. James writes this, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial or temptation, uh, because having stood the test or temptation, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So, this is what's at stake when we're talking about temptation. The crown of life. That's salvation. That's eternal life. That's what's at stake when we're talking about temptation. Those who persevere, those who pass the test, those who run away, they get the crown of life. This is big stuff we're talking about. And God is not the source of temptation. He's not the one tempting you. He actually limits it. Um, In the Lord's Prayer, God's role is to lead us away from temptation. There's no way he's going to lead us into temptation. And here, the source of temptation is evil, but it's not the evil one. It's not the devil. It's actually our own evil desires. We're being dragged away into sin, but we're the ones doing the dragging. We're dragging ourselves off into sin. Um, And back to this spirit versus flesh idea, right? I've got this flesh part of me that's dragging my spirit part, and they're they're at war with each other. Um, So we have desires that that are contrary to God's desires. And those desires turn into sin, and that sin turns into death. And we're not talking about physical death here. Everybody physically dies. We're talking here about spiritual death. That's where your temptation leads you. Your temptation leads you to sin, and the sin, when it gets full grown, leads to your spiritual death. This is serious stuff. These desires, these temptations, will bring us down if we allow them to. We all know of thousands of Christians who have been brought down because their desires turned into sin and their sin brought about death. There's lots of famous ones. Boy, It's almost an epidemic in the last year or two. There's hardly a week or month that goes by that I don't hear about some pastor of some massive church with some massive moral failure. He's become uh, stealing from the church or he's bullying his way around church or he's in prison in California for two years right now because he tried to meet up with an underage girl for sex. These are the kind of things that are happening, not just to pastors, but to all kinds of people. And we look at those big sins and we say, boy, that's not a problem for me. I'm not going to do that. None of these pastors set out 20 years ago to become the the horrible men that they've become. But little by little, those desires, when not kept in check, become sin. They give birth to bigger desires and bigger sin. And it cycles until these pastors end up where they are. And there's lots of these stories. And not just pastors, just individuals, people that we know who started out on a good path And somehow, little by little, these desires were not kept in check. And it's led to their spiritual death. So it's some big stuff. We need to be really careful, not with the big stuff. Be careful with the little stuff. The little stuff is going to lead to that big stuff. So it's serious stuff, but there is incredibly good news. There is really good news. And Heather read it already this morning. Hebrews chapter 2. This is the good news when it comes to temptation. For this reason, Jesus had to be made like them, that's us, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make some atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. 
Hallelujah. Jesus is there to help. He is like us. He's been made like us, fully human in every way. So we come back to that question, you know, was Jesus tested? Was it just a test like me with cheesecake where it's easy to say no? Or was it a real temptation for Jesus, like me with a pizza? And I, I battled with this question for years, trying to figure out, okay, what was it? I, I think it was temptation. I think it was genuine temptation. Jesus had, because he's fully human, there were desires in him that were, that were contrary to even what God wanted. We know that. Jesus desired not to die on a cross. The Father desired him to die on a cross. Jesus said, we'll do it your way. Your will be done. And whatever Jesus suffered, whatever he was tempted or, tempta- or testing, it's the same as us. He was tempted, we who are being tempted. It's the same word. We know what ours looks like. Jesus' looks the same. He actually knows what it's like to be tempted. That's incredible. He can actually help us in this. We actually have the best help in the world. And we carry on in Hebrews 4. We do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weakness. Jesus doesn't look down and say, I don't know what you're going through, man. I, I don't know how to feel that. Um, But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Okay? This is coming back to temptation is not sin. Temptation cannot be sin, because if it is, then Jesus sinned, because Jesus was tempted. But it's not the same. Temptation is not sin. Jesus was faithful in every one of his temptations and did not sin. Then let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus gets it. Jesus knows what it's like to face temptation. It is so much more comforting um, when someone can sympathize because they've been there themselves. You think of going through sickness or something, okay? Imagine you are dealing with a serious sickness. Imagine you have cancer and someone comes along and says, I know how you feel. I had the flu last week. Oh, no, no, you don't know how I feel at all. And then imagine someone comes along and says, I know how you feel. I've had that same kind of cancer or I'm going through that right now. Then you realize, okay, this person can actually help me. This person actually gets it. They've been through the chemo. They've been through all that. That's Jesus in temptation. He actually gets it. We have a high priest who's been tempted like we are, and yet he found a way out so that he didn't sin. That's good news for us. Um, Jesus was tempted like us, but he found victory. Therefore, Jesus can lead us to victory as well. That's, without without this, we're hooped, we're doomed. If we don't have Jesus on our side, we're not going to, we're never going to conquer temptation. But we have Jesus on our side. He's not up in the press box looking down and watching us. Oh, I wonder if they're going to do good this time or not. He's there. He's a teammate. He's on the ice with us. He's working with us, trying to help us. That's such good news. So I want to leave five conclusions as we end off this about temptation from what we've looked at. Number one, uh, the spirit versus flesh divide is real. We have a spirit in us that is willing, that wants to follow God with all our heart. And we have a flesh that we deal with that doesn't. And that divide is just real. um, And it it doesn't mean you're not a Christian. Just because you have temptations to do things that you shouldn't do doesn't mean you don't have the spirit. This is just a war that we've got, and we're going to have it until we die. Temptation is normal. It's a regular part of life. This doesn't mean it can't get better. If you're facing temptation with something right now that's just overwhelming, I'm not saying it's going to be overwhelming until you die. There actually are ways that we can, God can lead us into ways where we can avoid some of that temptation. It can get much, much better. But in some way, shape, or form, Till, till you die, you're going to face some temptations. That's why Jesus says, every day you should ask your father to lead you not into temptation and to deliver you from the evil one. Number three, when we do face it, God provides a way out. And usually that way out looks like running from it. Uh, running can look like a lot of different things. It can be going to a physical different place. Uh, maybe it's mentally going somewhere else, fixing your thoughts on something else, walking by the Spirit. Um, it's not about us going toe-to-toe with the devil, okay? We might get a few punches in, but he's not going down until Jesus comes back the final time. We're not going to win that fight. So as mature Christians, we actually don't engage in that fight. We just leave it all together. You can leave the devil in the ring all by himself. We're not fighting. 
We run away. We let God do the fighting for us. Nothing less than our salvation is at stake. The one who perseveres under temptation gets the crown of life. And the one who lets their desires turn into sin, that sin results in spiritual death. It's really important that we get a handle on this. And lastly, the good news, Jesus understands and he's ready to help. He's been there, he's walked through this, he can sympathize with us, and he is more than, more than ready to jump in at any moment's notice and help us with temptation. So this is what it means to pray, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from the evil one. And I want to just, as I close, take a little step back for a few minutes um, to look at this Lord's Prayer in general as a whole. Um, we find it at the very center of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 is this big collection of Jesus' teaching on what he expects his followers to look like. And at the very middle of it is this prayer. And if you remember back to some of the things we talked about in fall, it's a high calling. Jesus has high expectations for his followers. He expects us to be salt and light. He expects us to love our enemies, to give to the poor. We're supposed to be peacemakers. We're supposed to be merciful people. All these things that we're supposed to be. And Jesus knows if we're going to be like that, we're going to need the Father's help. And so this prayer comes in the middle of his sermon on what, he, what it means for us to be Jesus' people. This prayer gets us on track and it gets us the Father's help. We need the Father's help every day to be the kind of people Jesus wants. And that's what this prayer does. Every day it reorients us to that. Um, Last week on Monday, I had my day off, and I just needed to get out of the house. And so I got in my truck, and I headed west. And I haven't been past Cartwright yet, so I thought, i got to see what's past Cartwright. <laughs> Beautiful mountains and trees. No, <laughs> just more field. But I drove all the way to Killarney. And Killarney's a nice little town. I've been there before. And um, drove around town a little bit, and I, I saw the lake. And so I drove around the lake, saw all these nice houses along the lake, and and as I was, kind of got to the end of my road and I saw a sign for the number three highway, so I hopped back on and headed home. And it wasn't much to see because it was kind of a really cloudy day and it was sort of snowing a little bit. You can only see maybe half a mile. And I'm driving down the number three for about 10 minutes and I see a sign for a town that I didn't see on the way there. And I thought, Ninga, what? where am I? And I thought, I better pull out my phone. And I took out my phone and I looked and I was 10 miles west of... Killarney instead of 10 miles east. Um, so I pulled out my phone and was like, oh, I'm going the wrong direction. Now I know which way I need to point my truck to get home. Um, this is a little bit what this prayer does. Every day we can get off track. We can get headed in, our own, in a different direction where we're looking for our own will to be done. We want our own kingdom to come. We want our own things. Every day we pray this prayer and it puts us on the right track for that day. I would encourage you to make this practice of praying this prayer every morning. Try it for a little while. If you have someone you can do it with, wonderful. If you do it by yourself, fine, do it by yourself. I've made a practice to do this. It doesn't take me long. And I go through this prayer. And I say, Lord, I pray today that your name would be made holy. Whatever that's going to look like, I pray your name be honored. I pray that your kingdom comes in my town, and my family. Just you be the king, Jesus. I'm not the king. You're the king, your kingdom come. I say, God, your will be done. I have things that I want. If they're different than what you want, God, I pray that your will be done. Let's do things your way. I ask, um, Lord, I, I've, you've already given me my daily bread. My fridge is full, my pantry is full, so I don't ask for my daily bread. I say, thank you that you've already given me my daily bread before I even asked. And Lord, I pray for those who don't. I know there's people who are struggling for their daily bread, and so I pray for them. Sometimes I can add in there other things that I'm asking for. And then I ask for forgiveness. And I, I take a moment and I look in my heart and I say, God, what do I need to ask for forgiveness for? And sometimes God shines a light on something. It's like, you know, when you said that or you did that, that was actually pretty selfish. And I say, you know what, God, forgive me. I was selfish in that moment. And then I say, God, is there anybody I need to forgive? And God will show me, you know, yeah, this, you know, you didn't like what that person said. Just let it go. You don't have to hold it against them. And God shows me and I forgive people. And then I ask God, keep me from temptation. I'm do, I do horrible with temptation. Please just keep me from it. Keep me from the evil one today, Lord. 
just for today, not the rest of my life, just today, would you guard me and keep me? It's a great way for me to start my day. It makes a difference. It's not a magic prayer if you pray this or whatever, but I find it a good way. It orients me. It sends me in the right direction for the day when I start with just that. And then I can go on and I can pray for other things that are on my heart. But this is a really good way uh, for us to start our day. So I'd encourage you to try this. Um, And I think I'd be remiss if we didn't actually pray this prayer, right? So um, let's close this morning by praying this prayer. I know we all have different versions, so we'll use the version that's up on the screen. Um, Let's stand together. Worship team, you can come up if you want or pray first and then come.